everyone and welcome to this Skin Foundation webinar. Um, I know there's a lot of you out there and we're delighted that so many of you have chosen to take advantage of this uh, uh, meeting tonight, if you like, or this forum. What it is, is really in many ways an assimilation of uh, what has been an extraordinary year for all of us, despite um, our, our, our various skin conditions and so on. It has, of course, been an extraordinary time. And so it's a chance to assimilate really what has happened, uh, the relative developments, uh, how that has had an effect on our care and the topics that we're going to be uh, covering over the course of the evening, and as you can probably see now, our recent, recent uh, treatment advancements, what this means for the future of our eczema care, how COVID-19 has impacted uh, dermatology services, and of course, how they've adapted to deliver our care. And then we're going to turn our attention to that all important resource that we can take advantage of, and that is, uh, of course, the uh, Irish Skin Foundation um, Ask a Nurse Helpline. Connell Blake will be talking to her a little bit later on. And we're also delighted this evening to have Professor Alan Irvine, who, of course, has been so involved at the forefront of the more recent treatments, the biological treatments, for example. And I actually want to turn to you first, Alan, with a lot to um, cover tonight. But uh, I wanted you to um, just once again remind us about this extraordinary new drug. I, myself, am one of the grateful recipients, uh, and to explain um, the benefits for uh, people who suffer from uh, eczema. Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks to uh, Orla and David and everyone in the ISF for, for setting this up. And, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in to, um, to, to learn more about this. So dupinumab is, is a monoclonal antibody. So that's what that means is it's a, an antibody has been made to specifically recognize a target in humans. And that target are two messaging molecules called interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. They're hugely important in atopic dermatitis or eczema. They're also important in asthma as well, actually. So we might get everyone who's not speaking to mute, actually, because there's a little bit of background scratchy thing. So the um, so that drug has been in a development program really since uh, 2010. Um, and in 2011, there were what, what are called phase two trials. And then eventually in 2014, phase three trials that proved that it was very safe and very effective for the treatment of moderate and severe eczema. And that was tested in several hundred patients in those, those two trials uh, back then. Then had some further developments, um, further uh, work at looking at its safety and its effectiveness. And it was approved for use in 2017 in the European Union by the European Medicines Agency. Um, and it was, has been used in Germany since 2017 in the United Kingdom, including the north of Ireland since 2018. Uh, however, we just had approval for uh, use in Ireland in the 1st of April 2021. So just uh, six or so weeks ago, we got approval to use that. So dupilumab, it's the first drug that's really been specifically developed for atopic dermatitis. Uh, every other drug before that was what we call a repurposed drug. These are drugs that were used for cancer medicine or immune suppression of, uh, of maybe a transplant uh, patient, for example, like cyclosporin or azathioprine. And many of you are listening in who are familiar with the history of high eczema used to be treated and continues to be treated will be familiar with these kinds of what we call repurposed drugs, but Dupilium has been specifically designed for people with eczema. If you take 100 people with eczema and you give them Dupilium for 16 weeks, it's, a, it's an injection under the skin and uh, there's a loading dose and then it's every two weeks. And then you look at everybody at 16 weeks. On average, um, 60 out of the 100 people will be 75% better than when they started. So and about 60 out of, uh, about 50 out of 100 people will be almost entirely clear uh, from their treatment after 16 weeks. That's looking at their skin. If you ask them how their quality of life has improved, um, it will uh, it'll be higher than that. You know, 70 plus will report uh, important uh, improvements in their quality of, of life at 16 weeks. If you ask people, are they sleeping better? And is their itch reduced? Then it's much higher again. It's you know, eight or nine out of ten will report improvements in itch 
and then sleep at 16 weeks. That's uh, like it. Go ahead. Um, that I can attest for a lot of those things, but are there any um, uh, drawbacks with the drug, do you think? Anything that we should be aware of? Yeah, so they, it's a relatively adverse effect free treatment, is the key here. Um, there's no blood work. So, those of you who are familiar with um, having immune suppressants will know that there's a, there are worries about various things that they can do in a broader sense to your immune system, and there's monitoring that your prescribing doctor will agree with you um, to do that. That's not necessary for dupilumab. There's no blood work needed at all. The, um, the commonest adverse effect is uh, red eyes or red itchy eyes. And that occurs um, more commonly in people who've had severe facial eczema before they started dupilumab. It occurs more commonly in people who've had what we call atopic eye disease. So you'll be familiar, many of you who suffer from severe eczema, that eye disease is part of it in, for some. And if you're one of those people, then dupilumab can be more problematic. It's a rare reason to stop using the drug. You know, maybe fewer than one in a hundred people who start dupilumab will stop it because of an eye problem. And um, maybe 10 or 20% will stop it because it's not effective enough for them. And um, other adverse effects that come out are just a slight increase in cold sore infections, like herpes infections on the lips. They're a little bit commoner. Normally they're easy to treat. And normally the conductivitis or the red eye or the itchy eye, that's normally easy to treat. So one thing I should just mention about access to the drug. So the, the, the approval to, um, there is a background, I'm just gonna stop for a second because there's a background noise coming from somewhere. I should just say to uh, any of you who are listening, uh, just to remind you, uh, to, if you are in the listen only mode or if you're if not actually talking to, to possibly turn off uh, if you're joining us in the webinar, also, that this will be recorded and sent to attendees afterwards. Uh, if you would also take a few minutes to fill out the survey after, we would be very, very grateful for that. And um, also, there will be opportunity for you later on to um, post some questions if you were sorry, Alan, I interrupted you there, but uh, just to give um, people time to turn off. If, uh, yeah, no problem. If that's the if that's so, the um, the, uh, just to say about access to the drug, the um, the current licensing, the current reimbursement in Ireland requires uh, people to have to have met one of three conditions, which I'll go through. The first is that they have tried an immune suppressant in the last three years, a minimum of three months, and that that immune suppressant has been unhelpful. And that could be methotrexate, cyclosporin, azathioprine, microvenin. There's a number of those. So that's the first criterion you have to meet. Um, an alternative criterion is that you've tried an immune suppressant and it's had significant adverse effects that have meant that you couldn't, been, couldn't stay on it. And a third um, criterion that you can meet is that you're unsuitable to have any immune suppressant. So I have some patients who have histories of lymphoma or metastatic cancer who couldn't go on a immune suppressant in the first place um, and therefore they um, don't qualify. So how it works in getting access, just so people understand, it's it's not a friction-free process. The um, your prescribing doctor assesses: Do you meet one of these three criteria? And uh, they form fill in a a, a a form. It's a paper form, and current, unfortunately, with it's not actually working as of Friday. But look, that's a temporary thing. But they fill in a, a temporary for a form, a seven pager with your history and with your permission. Uh, certain details of your history need to be shared then with the um, with the HSE medicines management program. So that's a selection of pharmacists who will adjudicate um, uh, on your suitability and your reimbursability for the drug, depending on what your doctor sends in. And do you meet one of those three criteria that we've mentioned? So that panel sits on Thursdays and they generally issue their uh, recommendations on a Friday. Again, we didn't get any last Friday because um, I'm putting them in every week because I, I have a huge number of patients. Um, but they, um, so we, did, we didn't get any approvals on a Friday, but typically they approve that. And then the prescription is raised uh, on what's called a high tech hub linked by your PPS number to make sure that you're, uh, el you're eligible. And then your pharmacist will see that in real time. Again, that's not working at the minute because it, it's um, 
uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, down, but it will be again. So your pharmacist sees that in real time. You go in and pick up the drug. You bring it back to your house to put it in your fridge. It's an injectable biologic drug, remember. Um, and at, around about that time, the patient support program run by a company called TCP Healthcare, who've been in this in this space for a very long time, um, supporting people at home, they will send out a nurse who will teach you how to do the subcutaneous injections, do the first two or three with you. Um, they'll tell you how to dispose of the sharps after you've done it. They'll supply a sharps box. They'll give you any ongoing uh, support in addition to the support that you might get from your, your prescribing doctor and from the nurse specialists uh, who also will work uh, alongside the, the prescribing doctor. So that's what it looks like. There's no guarantee that you, that, that you have an automatic entitlement to it. It has to go through this, uh, this mechanism. And then there's a second part to that, which is after 16 weeks, you have to have improved by a certain amount. And that's me measured by life quality and by another thing called like an easy score that your prescribing doctor will have to do for you. Do you think, Alan, moving forward, for example, as I said, I'm one of the grateful beneficiaries of this. I've been on it, had compassionate access for about six months now, and, uh, but I've run into trouble with my um, application, my uh, um, in entitlement to have it through the HSE now that things are changing. Um, do you think uh, that, that there, these problems are, are just... Um, Grumbles at the very beginning of this new opportunity, and that they, you know we'll all find our way around them. I do believe so. I think the um, I think there are two categories of patient applying. Uh, there's people who, who got the drug on the early access program, and that's always a little messier call, you know, because the um, uh, the criteria were not in place when you would have achieved your access to the drug, and those criteria may be different than the current one. So people who were who are historic or legacy patients, they um they can run into some difficulties. The the good thing, of course, for all early access program, there were seventy four people, I believe, on early access, and um, the company ha has agreed with the HSE that anyone who got it on early access, they will continue to provide for. So um nobody will on the early access will lose access to the drug. So I think everyone should be reassured about that and not anxious that they're doing really well and their lives are going to fall apart because the drug is going to be withdrawn from them. That will not happen. Um, the, um, for new applications, it's, um, it's very clean. Um, I've had um, about eight approvals for new patients. That, that means people who meet the criteria and I fill in the form for them and send it in and go through all the, go through all the hoops. Um, and they've been approved. Uh, occasionally I filled in the forms and when you fill in the form, everything is cross-checked and audited. So they, um, by giving your PPS number, the HSC can access what drugs you've been dispensed. So let's say you have been on methotrexate, they can check if you've been on methotrexate and they will check that. So the form has to be obviously truthful and, and um, cross-checked. Um, and sometimes they come back for extra information and it's, Look, it's a little time consuming. We've got to go to pharmacies and get attestations that people have been given the drug. So that slows things down a little bit. Um, in general, the program has been very professional, very slick um, for new applications. For older applications, it's sometimes a bit clunky because people don't um, easily meet the current criteria. But in those cases, the safety net is, is Sanofi have agreed to provide people in perpetuity for as long as they require the drug that they will get it. Hopefully that clears it, but I'll take any other questions. Alan, you've, uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time there talking about, of course, this new drug because it's the big thing at the moment, but I just wanted to move on more generally uh, with your experience as a consultant. How do you think um, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, the treatment uh, of, of those of us who suffer from dermatological complaints? Uh, has it been very adverse? Have we managed well? What have the changes been and has anything come out of it that could be seen as being possible? Yeah, Paul, could you turn the sound off on your computer because, um, so not mute, your, not mute yourself, that means you can't be heard, but if you switch the sound off on your computer, people can't hear me feeding back through your microphone. Um, 
Is that okay? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. So um, the the COVID, yeah, the, the pandemic has been challenging for everyone. You know, there's no question about that uh, for patients and, and for sort of those uh, caring for them. Sometimes it's been hard to see people face to face and it's difficult if you've got inflammatory skin disease or if you've got cancer to really do that remotely. Where it's worked well, if we take the positives, it's accelerated electronic prescribing. That's been good. So we can use the health mail system, although that currently is down, but it will be back up. So that's been a big bonus. That's been there for years and now it's now it's um, been used to its full potential. The high tech hub, which used to mean that you did your prescriptions on a hub, had to print them out, sign them. That's not electronic. That's big advance for patient convenience. Um, we've gotten more relaxed with people who are well controlled on biologic drugs. Uh, for example, at seeing them less often, I think that's been a big advance. I think um, there's been more in the way of shared care uh, with, with primary care. And that's been good, although at the minute that's under challenge because uh, the GPs are just so busy with, with this kind of vaccination program, which is taking a huge amount of time, obviously. But that will come back again so that people don't have to make as many visits to hospitals. So there's been some positives, but I'm always interested to hear what patients think as well, because, you know, I only see one one side of it sometimes, apart from what uh, people tell me. Do you think, Alan, there's a way that we should um, prepare ourselves, particularly for these virtual consultations, of which there have been more often recent times, are there things we should bear in mind? Absolutely. I always write down what you want to say, because... Uh, and prepare yourself with a list of questions and no doctor can, can have any problem with that because you want to make the, the, um, the consultation as useful as possible to the patient. So you know, sometimes when you get in, it's easy to get a little flustered and forget to ask two or three things. Um, so write down a list well in advance of what you, what you expect to get out of the consultation. You know what, it's not a bad idea doing that before any medical consultation, you know, to be a little bit prepared because you know, we try to make these relaxed, but sometimes they're not that relaxed. So uh, <laughs> make them as relaxed as you can and write down the questions. And I think that's, that's incredibly helpful. If you have any blood results uh, that your doctor on the other end of the phone may not have seen, for example, that may have been done in a local hospital or by your GP, then absolutely have those beside you. If you can, that's always, that's always helpful or any new information that um, has not been available. It's good to know um, your pharmacy health mail address. That's always really useful because it means afterwards the prescription can be directly sent to your pharmacy, which saves a lot of um, time for you. You know, that means that you just ring your pharmacy and say, have you got the prescription? And can I come pick it up? Uh, which is a nice thing. So those things um, as to get to these new ways of working really, um, can just make the whole end-to-end -end experience a little bit more convenient for, for everybody. Um, and I think we all get a little bit better at it, but we do like to see each other and we do like to see our patients. So um, I think the, the virtual things, we might move to more of a hybrid thing for people we know really well. And for new patients, we definitely want to see them face-to-face. -face. Well, talking about the facilities that we um, have offered traditionally through the Irish Skin Foundation, that aren't face to face, but that have been very successful over a great length of time is, of course, the, uh, the clinical uh, helpline, the uh, Irish Skin Foundation's helpline. And I, I want to talk, uh, if I may, to our colleague, Carmel Blake. Carmel, um, welcome, welcome to the evening. Thanks very much for taking the time. And I want to know from you, um, how do you feel this uh, pandemic has impacted on the all important work that the helpline does? Um, I think with the helpline, we bridged a gap for people living with skin disease in the community and um, we operate a unique service that's operated by dermatology nurse specialists that currently work in the hospital setting and it's a callback service where people can submit a question or they can call the helpline and an appointment will be arranged for them on a callback service. We're lucky on the helpline, Paul, that we do have 
nurses that specialize in general dermatology and in pediatric dermatology. So when the, the administrator, the managing administrator gets the call, she triages the call and makes an appointment then for the patient with one of the nurses. The thing Have you found yourself to be busier, Carmel, during this pandemic? Oh. Have you been under more demand? Yeah, we have been under um, more demand, Paul. During the lockdown in um, March 2020, we would have seen a huge surge in calls. There was approximately 66% increase in calls in the, uh, the lockdown. And as a result, because there was such a huge surge in calls, we actually looked at the 12 weeks of the lockdown and compared it to the same period for 2019 to see what were the difference in the calls that came through to us. And we found that 33% of the calls were directly related to COVID. And a lot of them were around the immunosuppressed and medications you know, people were worried when they were on the medications, if they contacted COVID, whether they'd be able to fight uh, the virus, if their immune system would be strong enough to deal with it. Yeah. And then some people developed rashes and they were worried whether it was a COVID rash because there was quite a lot of coverage about COVID rashes and people were very well informed because they were on the internet and social media. So they might just ring us and say, do you reckon I need a COVID test? You know, Carmel, just talking to Alan Irvine there, we had a very um, detailed explanation of these very cutting edge drugs that come much further down the line, I would say, for um, people who've suffered uh, from eczema for a very long time. It's probably important to point out that the helpline that the Irish Skin Foundation provides is um, for absolutely anyone uh, who, who has never really experienced proper uh, dermatological help or care for their condition. It's open to everyone. In other words, uh, everyone, uh, there's no one who's more eligible than anyone else and everyone is equally entitled to this particular uh, facility. Yeah, you're right there, Paul. Like some people would contact us that have a diagnosis. And of course, it's easier to talk to them because we can talk about treatments, treatment options, um, expected outcomes, what the side effects. But people that do contact us without a diagnosis, we will still give them advice. And we did do a survey with people that had contacted the helpline to see if the information that they receive from nurses helped mm -hmm. their skin condition. And the survey that we conducted revealed that 73% of callers that did not have a diagnosis still had improvement of symptoms just by following the general guidance provided by the nurses. Uh, it, it's reassuring to hear that and, and to know that that facility is available. And I would also remind um, a lot of you listening, as I say, we have a survey um, that we would um, be very grateful as many of you as possible would complete that for us. It's very important to the work of the Skin Foundation. And I would say to the helpline in particular, because, uh, you know, the, the Skin Foundation, the people who work, have to know um, what you want. Yeah, like we would have, um, apart from people living with skin conditions contacting us, maybe their partners contact us so that they can support them, a family member. And then we would have other healthcare professionals that would reach out to us as well. It might be a practice nurse or a public health nurse that is struggling managing a person with a skin problem in the community and they just ring us for any tips that we may be able to give them regarding treatment. We may have people, um, occupational, health nurses that you know some of their employees may have rashes on the hands from the increased hand hygiene measures so an awful lot of people reach out to the helpline it's not just 
people with skin conditions, it's healthcare professionals as well, managing people in the community. So it's great that we have that resource with such well-trained nurses manning the, the helpline. Carmel, are you satisfied at this stage that the uh, connection is um, sufficient, as good as it was, or maybe even better um, than it ever has been in terms of providing a bridge that leads the people who come to your helpline find the kind of care that they need? Absolutely. I think as well, Paul, but because all of our nurses are in current practice, that they have resources to turn to for advice if somebody with a very unusual condition contacts us. Um, I think we're well established now, the, the helpline in the fact that we're now five years helping people and we have provided a good service. We've had good feedback from service users, which is great. And people come back to us for advice again and again. They trust and us, I think. Concern, I'm just interested to know what is the most um, popular way of contacting you? Is it online? Is it by phone? Is there any particular? Um, either by calling the helpline number or going onto the Irish Skin Foundation website and filling in the Ask a Nurse form. So it's really, you know, it's, it's whatever suits the individual. You'll be equally well served, no matter what way you wish to contact. Definitely. Some, um, some people do like to have a certain amount of anonymity. So email suits them. It doesn't absolutely. matter whether the email or telephone, they'll still get the service. Tell me this, do you think with more online connection between patients, the helpline, dermatologists, generally speaking, is this going to be something that is going to become very much more a part of the way that we communicate with each other? I mean, I know the last um, Skin Side Out public meeting that we had in um, uh, Trinity, it's hard to believe that that's as long ago as it was, but it's now, it's coming up probably for, for 18 months, two years or whatever. Those were great, those occasions, but do you think that this virtual means of communication is something that's going to become more commonplace, more prevalent than ever before? Sorry, Paul, is that virtual communication through the Irish Skin Foundation? Or? Yes, yes. Um, I think so many people find us now through online searches. Sometimes we would get people that are relocating to Ireland as well that contact us to find out if they're on treatment in another country, whether they're going to be able to get the same treatment when they come to Ireland. Um, so people are looking to the internet to get more information and the Irish Skin Foundation is one of the, the people that they contact. You know, it's, it's a good resource for them. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, there was no Irish Skin Foundation when I first came into the sort of full flush of eczema at its height in, in my 20s, for example. And uh, it strikes me that today this is a very good point of contact from which to begin your treatment at the helpline. Yeah, because even if you're struggling with your skin and you haven't got into the system yet the nurses would be able to give you guidance and general skin care advice yes. on how to manage the skin and often people because they're doing it from their own home the person living with the skin condition is more relaxed and the nurse that's on the helpline probably has more time to explain and discuss treatments because again they're also working remotely they're not in the busy clinic set um, setting where they're conscious of people waiting and you know trying to get through the clinic so i think the irish skin foundation ask a nurse does have a lot to offer 
And it offers that all important uh, reference that gives us some kind of support on the long waiting route. I mean, I know that when I was referred for the very first time to a consultant, it was some two and a half years. That was a long time. Now, I think it's certainly better in the Southwest where I'm based now than it was. Um, it's a much bigger clinic, for example, it's the regional and so on. But of course, not everybody is that lucky. And it's always seemed to me that that's one of the most important things about the, um, the helpline and that the Irish Skin Foundation is. And, you know, the fact you may feel um, at times so frustrated by the, the length of time that you feel you might have to wait, but this is there immediately. Yeah, I think the nurses can offer tips on how to manage the symptoms, whether it's, you know, the itch or the burning, um, the sleeplessness, the overheating of the skin, depending on what the, the condition is, um, that they can give the person some basic tips on managing the condition that helps them to to cope until they get into the system. Well, I should say, um, for those of you who are watching, anyone who wants to um, ask any questions or put any questions, now is the time to do that. I don't see anything flashing up in front of me just at the minute, but I know at some stage that will probably happen. So do feel free if there's something that you uh, want to um, ask us, anything that occurs to you, uh, now is the time to do it. We talked a lot about the um, the importance and the significant now of um, virtual consultation, but um, it, it's still, I suppose, th there's nothing that beats that 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 an immediate contact. But in a way, uh, the helpline's been at the forefront of that for many years because you're providing a kind of virtual consultation uh, long before it's become as commonplace as it has in these last few years in these last few months rather. Yeah, that was something about the helpline was that we were providing a virtual service. So during COVID, there was no disruption of the service. And I think that's what led to the surge in calls was the fact that we were so accessible and that we were still there. And during the lockdown, believe it or not, there was a 221% increase in people that contacted us without a diagnosis. And I think some of that was attributed to the fact that people were afraid to go to the GP. Yeah. They were staying at home. So it was easier to make the call or to send an email to the, the Ask a Nurse helpline. It's interesting that the figures are up. Uh, do you think uh, there is um, a better awareness of skin conditions today than there ever has been? Yeah, I think probably, you know, through searching on the internet and then, you know, with Instagram, people are more in contact on social media, so the word does spread. I have a, a couple of questions here. And I, 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 they're just sort of popping up in front of me, and I want to turn to those, um, particularly in the time that we have left. And thank you very much, everybody, for um, doing that. Uh, uh, the first one that I see that comes from one of our anonymous attendees, that the helpline is a fantastic service, and they wish to thank everyone involved in it. And uh, uh, um, that is good to hear, of course. Uh, but uh, one of the questions I've been asked uh, here is uh, from another anonymous attendee who's t telling me that they've tried Protopic recently. I think a lot of us have had uh, experience with that particular drug over uh, many years now. But this particular person has tried Protopic recently, and after a few days, we're told it made this patient really jittery, quite anxious, sensitive to cold, etc. Now they've heard that that is normal. Do these symptoms subside with a continued use because it was scary? So Carmel, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer it? I don't I'll mind. Let, I'll let you uh, answer if that's okay. Yeah. Sorry, Alan, I thought I wasn't sure whether you were there or not. It's good to see you again. <laughs> oh no, I'm here. I'm just 
staying quiet when everybody else is working. Um, <laughs> the um, you know, the topic's not for everyone. It, it the application site reactions are burning quite common with Protopic. The um, it tends to work better as a skin maintainer. You know, so when your skin is being treated for a short time with topical steroids, introducing Protopic to keep that improvement is probably is the way that most people find it useful. It's not very useful to put on really hot, angry or inflamed skin. Very few people like that. Um, so you can try that, you know, pre-treating a little bit with steroids first and then seeing does it reduce your, your requirement for topical steroids over the following weeks and months. That's really how it works best. But there are some people who just never really tolerate it well. If it's not for you, don't use it because, um, you know, it, it doesn't work for everyone. So that's 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 all I can really say about Protopic. If it's not for you, set it aside. But if you've only tried it in the context of it work on really hot skin, then it might be worth trying pre-treating with steroids for a week or two first and seeing does that work a bit better for you. It's useful on sensitive sites, you know, your face, skin folds, and it can uh, eliminate the the amount of steroids you're using, which will cause some long-term effects on the, on sensitive sites. So that's why your doctor would have tried it for you. But um, as I said, some people it just doesn't work. I'm very interested in what you've said about Protopic, Alan. I've always found that after many years of, of topical steroids, that, that, and, and you've touched on it there, that it's, it's sort of a balancing act that is very particular to the patient themselves. Balancing act, when I say a balancing act, a balancing act that allows you to use it with steroid because of course it's less damaging than the steroidal. Yeah, that's true. Um, I have another question for you, Alan, from another patient um, who tells me that they've spent a lot of time outdoors in the summer and should they spend less consecutive hours outdoors? What are the best sunblocks, the sun creams to avoid irritating eczema that you already have? Yeah, it's really difficult, you know, because it's such a personal um, choice. Sometimes you've got to try several you know, people who've got long standing eczema. Their, their skin is much less tolerant generally than uh, the average population of, of just about anything that's put on. In general, the, the physical blocks uh, for most people are better tolerated. That doesn't mean for everyone. So what, you know, to, those would be the more zinc and titanium based blocks um, that you can get. That, that typically don't have as many chemicals and, and are tend to be less uh, irritating. You know, a, a wide brimmed hat, of course, is also extremely useful. So uh, that's easy to use and it deflects some of the, the sun from your face. If you want a physical block, uh, I think UV stat is pretty good um, for UV I S T A T. Uh, but sometimes you've got to try a bunch of them, I'm afraid. It's just, and there's no. Um, way of saying this one will be perfect for you until you try it. You know, if you can get some samples from your from your dermatology clinic, that's always good. It saves you buying a, a full size uh, tube because they are quite expensive sunblocks. So if you can get a small sample off the pharmacist or off your off your uh, dermatologist, that's helpful. You can try a few and see which is the best suiting for you. Listen, here's a question that's very near to my heart. I have to say, another of our um... Uh, um, attendees today says that they find it extremely difficult using hand sanitizers. They are not alone, let me assure them. And uh, that they react very strongly to sanitizing sprays for trolleys, for example, in supermarkets, all that kind of thing. Their skin is peeling and lifting because of this. Is this common? Um, yes, first thing is it is common and it's a lot commoner in the pandemic. And you know what we know is that you know, COVID isn't really spent, isn't really spread by touching surfaces. You know, back in last February when we knew nothing about COVID, there was a huge worry about that, you know, you could catch it off plastics and so on. And that, that turns out to be really quite a low risk. So I've spent quite a bit of the pandemic talking to eczema patients about their hands being terribly painful. And I think it is possible to get into an overwashing and an over sanitizing mode. You know, it's not wanting to counter all of the public health advice, yeah. but I think for people with eczema, the rules are a bit different. And I've certainly written to kids, schools and workplaces and said, look, you know, there's, there's some accommodations have to be made here and more gentle hand washes and more frequent moisturizing uh, and so on. 
so yes, it is common and you probably don't need to sanitize as much as you as you as you may have thought last sort of maybe March or April. You know, for what it's worth, I find that uh, I've had exactly that problem with my own hands and it has been quite, you know, it's, it's been a pressing problem during the last year or so. I find that actually using, not, I, I know good with latex gloves, or I don't think any of us would be, but the polythene gloves and simply putting the sanitizer on top of that. But when I am in a situation where that's appropriate, has been the solution for me at any rate, if it's helpful to anyone, but that's what I've had to do. I want to move on to another question here from uh, Caroline Murray, who says that her seven-year-old was due to begin methotrexate, but it was put on hold due to the COVID situation. What is the uh, panel's opinion of the use of methotrexate due to the fact that it's an immunosuppressant at this time? Yeah, so Caroline, I don't, you know, it's probably not the best forum to discuss individual cases, but the just in a general sense, um, you know, we haven't, I haven't stopped anybody uh, on methotrexate due to COVID, and I've started dozens of people since last February uh, on methotrexate. So I'm happy to come to com kind of comment in a general sense there. Um, on the specific thing about your seven-year-old, like I hope they get sorted out. Um, and I don't think the fact that COVID is around is in my view, a reason not to start it, but that's just my view. And I don't know the full totality of your of your child's um, history. At least I don't think I know, unless they're one of my patients and I've forgotten uh, that it is. So I'm sorry, I might not know all of that, but in general, I don't think I've stopped anybody um, uh, or not started them during COVID, we've just gone straight ahead. Um, another uh, attendee has said to me, would you suggest getting allergy tested again? It's interesting me this question because I can relate to it myself. Say they were tested as early as at two years old um, for all the usual things at that time, dust mites and cat hair and, and various other things. But can you become allergic to other substances as you age and get much older? Is it possible? To, to become allergic to something that you never realized you were before. Oh yeah, you can accumulate allergies through life. Um, the question for for this um, questioner really is, look, is it just that the new house is dustier or there's, there's some of the things that you know that you're already allergic to, there's just more of them, or has your, have your allergies spread? So if you get an allergy to something in the air, typically it won't be just your eczema gets worse. Normally you'll have some what we call wet surfaces uh, eruptions like red itchy eyes or sneezy nose or cough in your lungs. If it's an immediate allergy, you normally get more than just your skin. Um, if it's a general thing that you're worried about in the atmosphere, but the common things that people react to are grasses and tree pollens, animal dander, that can be cat, dog, horse, and um, house dust mite. Those are the things that are in the, in the atmosphere um, that, that can certainly trigger flares of, of eczema in people who've got high levels of allergy. So it might be, um, based on what you've said there, it's not enough to really give you a really full, accurate answer to that truthfully, um, but it, it could be, it could be useful for you, at least to know what you're, what you're triggering. But there can be other environmental things with a change of house that are um, less straightforward, you know, it can be humidity or lack of humidity. It can be just the, the, the atmosphere within the house. The stress of moving house, there can be lots of things that, that, that lead to a trigger. The type of water in the house, is it hard water or soft, soft water? So there can be a whole bunch of things that really impact on your skin that um, may not be all allergy mediated. So the answer to that, I'm afraid I'm gonna hedge, it could be, but it could be a bunch of other things as well. I think um, the bottom line. I hope, I, hope, I hope that doesn't take the edge off your nice house. <laughs> um, that would be horrible. I think the bottom line to a lot of our questions is, as you were reminded always at a forum like this, is that, that we all have a, a different experience of eczema. It's amazing how bewilderingly different all our experiences can be. But we have the one common objective, and that is to work with it and to make the most of the opportunities that we have available to us. I really want to thank um, Alan Irvine, Professor Alan Irvine, once again, for giving so much of his time, so generously as he always does, and for uh, lending us such insight, and of course to Carmel Blake, who is at the very forefront 
of the services that the Irish STEM Foundation itself has to offer. Um, I've got one, um, uh, another um, email question came in there just saying, just wanted to say the Irish STEM Foundation is brilliant, such a great service, great to be able to ring you from home. Thank you very much, whoever you are, uh, for that, because of course, that's uh, reassuring for us to hear as well. Um, it is always a pleasure to get together, to be able to communicate, no matter how difficult the circumstances, and I hope very much that we'll be able to, uh, you know, meet up again for um, another skin side out occasion, such as the last one we had in Trinity. We can um, only hope, but in the meantime, I do want to thank all of you for um, participating so willingly today. Of course, to Alan and to Carmel, to uh, Orla at the Irish Skin Foundation and David McMahon for all their tireless work that they always do and um, for making it uh, so easy for me and keeping me so well briefed so that I could hopefully um, steer us um, through this without too many um, accidents or disasters. But it is important that I remind you um, uh, once again uh, to remind you that there is a survey. It would really be enormously helpful for all of us if you could fill that in or take the time to fill it in. It won't take long. And of course, to remind you of the uh, constant services that uh, you can call on through the Irish Skin Foundation, in particular, the Ask a Nurse Helpline for you or indeed anyone else who you think might benefit from that facility. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. As I say, everyone at Skin Foundation for facilitating this to Alan and Carmel, and uh, every possible good wish to uh, to all of you as uh, we continue our um, quest to uh, find the best way to cope with this very challenging condition that we all have in common. Thank you very much.